guys, Coach Kassim here to talk to you guys about quad dominant squats. So we're going to look at the principles of what makes a quad dominant squat and why some people have trouble achieving a quad dominant squat and what are the tools that you can use to make a quad dominant squat and then actually looking at, okay, if you use all these tools or whatever, what actually has to happen? What does that squat have to be looking like for us to call it a quad dominant squat? So that you can understand if you are a person that can just squat quad dominant on your own with no like changes to your training, no uh, heel elevation, etc. Or if you're somebody that can get there with a little bit of modification and special setup. Or if you're a person where, you know, squats just, you know, despite the fact that they are good exercise, they just don't happen to be a very good quad exercise for you. So the first thing that we're going to do is go through some simple principles for a quad dominant squat. So the first one is, is that you want the range of motion to come from knee flexion and extension. So we're working the quads which go around the knee. So our goal is that through the entire range of motion of this squat there is knee flexion, knee extension, and that is the dominant movement. So the greatest range of motion that any joint goes over throughout you know, an exercise is going to likely be the thing that our nervous system is paying attention to and where the majority of the force and stuff is being provided. Okay, So when we look at a squat, we want knee flexion, so from the top down, the knee bend to be the thing that initiates the movement, and then we want knee extension to be the thing that initiates the concentric, so coming out of the bottom. So the bottom of your squat should be where the knee reaches terminal flexion, and then you initiate with extension. And the top of your squat should be initiated with a knee drive. So the nervous system always you know, also kind of has this thing, it's called like what works first works most. Um, and you know, obviously there's, you know, you could make some examples of where that may not happen if we did a whole bunch of weird things. But typically what happens is that when we place force on the body and something has to absorb that force, it is going to want to maintain control of that force as long as it's somewhat mechanically efficient at that. Meaning that you wouldn't start using your hips and be, you know, because you drove your butt back and then start dropping down and all of a sudden just let your hips go and shift it over. That's more complex, right? And it would require you to remanipulate your body and center mass and all of that thing to make that mechanically efficient. So our goal is to load those quads from the beginning with knee flexion and make sure that they are the thing that is initiating the movement on the way up with knee extension. So that kind of rolls into point number two is that the movement needs to end to begin with knee movement. So if you were to do a squat and the knee closed but then you kept folding at the hip, in order to come back up what you will see is the first thing that happens is usually some sort of a spinal extension or something like that like butt coming in or so. If the hip movement is what is getting or initiating that load coming up, it is obviously taking over the most mechanically challenging portion of the exercise. So knee extension and needs to be the thing that it initiates you coming out of the bottom. And that can't happen if knee flexion isn't the thing that takes you to the bottom of your squat. So your active range of motion for a quad dominant squat is all going to be about the knee. It's not going to be at the hip. It's going to be when does the knee fully close? When do we get that hamstring on calf? Uh, type position and to be honest like some people take that you have to understand that our goal is to flex the knee but not deload the knee or switch to a different type of lever at the knee so there's a balance between getting the hamstrings touching the calves versus letting that tissue actually compress which turns the knee into a pry type joint so when we say we want to get the full knee flexion that does not mean that like we just kind of let go and let all that weight like squish our you know our thigh and our lower leg together we should be still under quadricep control and not turning that joint into like a prying motion it's one of the reasons why sometimes a quad dominant squat will bother some of these knees is they're switching over to that especially if you're doing it with heavy loads and you're not really coming into that eccentric end range under control okay number three is that the knee travels further from the center of mass than the hips. So basically what that means is the knees need to be going forward. So if we, you look at somebody doing a squat from the side, you'll notice their butt goes back and their knees go forward. What we need to happen is the knees need to go forward more than the butt goes back. Because the joint that gets further away from the center has a longer lever. That means 
in order for it to help move us up, it has to do more work. More torque has to be exhibited around that joint if you want to use those type of terms. So if you're looking at a squat, if the butt's further back, there's more load around the hip joint. If the knee is further forward, there's more load around the knee joint. So if we want to bias quads, we want to be able to end up with a squat where our knees are further away from our center of mass. And we'll go through some illustrations of that, but basically center mass is going to be midfoot because that's where we're going to balance our load. So if you tend to watch somebody, you know, doesn't matter if they're doing a front squat, back squat, safety squat, their body contorts in a way that we position the majority of our load over midfoot. Otherwise we fall over, right? Simple physics right there. So what can cause some people not to be able to do this, not to be able to get a quad dominant squat? Well, one is poor ankle mobility. Uh, and that is because in order to get the knees forward, you have to be able to bend at the ankle. So there's a certain, a certain amount of ankle mobility that has to be there. But a lot of people may have decent ankle mobility in terms of how, well, like the degree that their you know, ankle can dorsiflex in this case, you know, toes towards the shin position. But for their structure, the lengths of the levers in their body, they would require a lot more than average knee flexion to get to the same spot. And when I say structure, we're going to point number two, and that's a long femur. So your femur, your thigh bone, if you think about it, it goes horizontal. So the longer your femur, the further the knee and the hip point are going to be. If you imagine like somebody with a thigh parallel, a longer femur means things start to go this way. So if this gets spread out this way, and I got a foot underneath here somewhere, the longer that femur goes out, the more like ankle mobility or the more dorsiflexion I have to have to be able to to be able to go into that position. Whereas if somebody has a short femur, I don't need as much ankle mobility to sit down into a squat. So people that have long femurs are going to need more ankle mobility respectively to get to a bottom or a full type squat, especially a quad dominant squat. Everybody can pretty much do a hip dominant squat because you just bend over at the hip. Okay. Um, now, when we look at this femur thing, one thing I want to say, because it's not just like tall people have a hard time squatting, it is the femur in relationship to the torso and the tibia. So it's the ratio of how big or long these segments of the body are. So if somebody has a longer torso, what that allows them to do is be able to stay up a little bit more, like a little bit more upright in their squat relatively. So it also allows them to put more load on the hips by bending over with less weight. So just two things. Having a longer tibia allows us to be able to have or you know, use less dorsiflexion to get to the same position. So if you think of it, like if this is my tibia and it starts to bend this way, if it was longer, it would be sticking further out, right? So a long tibia to femur ratio decreases the need for ankle mobility. A long torso can allow me to sit more upright, which means I don't have to kick my butt back as far, which means I can keep my knees further forward. So having either a long torso or a long tibia help balances, helps balance out the femur. So if they're all pretty even, you'll see that you know most people can get to somewhat of a full squat. But if you are in the opposite direction, which a lot of people you know have a long femur, short torso, they may be very restricted in what they can do with the squat unless we alter that setup, okay? Number three and four on here, three is technique, which I mean, really just comes down to you could not have the base skill set to understand how to go into that, which after this video, hopefully that you, you have that. But number four is strength. So what we also have to consider is an exercise like the squat, anything where it's an open chain, where we have multiple joints that can get loaded, what my squat looks like is going to come, or how that looks, strength is going to be a factor. Because if to, in order to get one joint further away from that center of mass, I have to be able to put more load around that joint, which means I have to be able to have the strength to do it. So miscalculating the load, trying to lift too much for what your current strength is, will make it pretty much impossible for you to use a technique that biases one of these joints if you don't have that strength around that joint. So if your quads are a weakness and you've been doing hip dominant squats and you've worked up to a certain load and then you try and use that same load and try and make it more knee dominant, 
if you don't have the strength, what's going to happen is mechanically you're just going to have to shift back towards that hip dominance, especially as you fatigue. So you, you, can't, you can't load a joint that you don't have the capacity to you know, control. So that's where we'll see you know, even worse technique breakdowns and more compensation patterns if somebody tries to just, they just try, try and use a technique that they just simply don't have the strength or the skill set to do yet. Okay. So the next thing I want to look at is just how general squat stance and how those are going to affect this. So to pull this up here, I am going to get rid of my face for a second and we will put you there. So when we're looking at the foot positions that you could use in a squat, right? And I'm going to switch this back over and make that just a little bit bigger. We have basically three main stances that you're going to use in squats. One's going to be a shoulder width squat, uh, where your feet are going to be what we would call like semi-neutral. Um, and so that semi-neutral position is not completely straightforward, but somewhat slightly externally rotated. Uh, and usually with that, you're going to have a, a lot of people, are, you know, if they're built to squat, they can get some good work done now. They may be able to get full knee flexion. Um, we'll go into the limitations of these you know, on an individual basis. The next one is going to be a little bit more narrower at the heel and externally rotated, so the middle one here. And what that's going to do is it's going to push your knees out a little bit more, so it's going to put us in a position where we have more mobility at the hip because the way our pelvis is shaped, at a certain point, our femur and pelvis are going to start kind of impinging on each other if we don't abduct a little bit, right? Our thighs will just start running into our torso. So opening that stance from an external rotation perspective can open up more range of motion at the hip. And then if I remove me so you can see the far right version is the wide and externally rotated version. So usually on this, the external rotation it does not have to be to the same degree um, and it's a little bit wider. So if we go through these on a one-by-one -one basis and we start with this guy here, okay, the neutral or semi-neutral shoulder wrist dance, this can limit range of motion at the hip, and that's mainly going to be because if your, knee, if your hips need to go wider for you to be able to get to that spot, they're just going to be running into you. And the last thing that you want to have is your feet straight forward and your knees pointed out. Right? We want our feet and our thighs to essentially to be looking like they're going in the same plane at the bottom of the squat. So for some people, they may be able to get a quad dominant squat in this position. Um, they may not be able to get a full depth, like ass to grass type squat in this position, but this squat does end in the glute range, if you can see the last bit of text I have on there, right? Because the lengthened position for really trying to challenge the glutes is going to be closer to that shoulder width point. As we start to open our stance, we will be able to go wider, but then it starts to become more adductor and less glutes, as you will see. So the next one here, right, is going to be this one that is externally rotated but fairly narrow. This generally allows for the greatest range of motion, um, you know, in terms of a full squat. It may not be the most ideal if we are going for just pure glutes. Right, so you can see the full text there. But you see that that squat that Austin's doing down there, he's able to get depth very, very easy. He could sink into that if he wanted to. Um, so this is going to be the deepest squat, per se, um, and basically getting us the most range of motion at both the knee and the hip when we're just looking at the flexion of those when uh, not considering whether this is glute or, or adductor dominant. Okay, and then that third version I had up here all right, is the wide stance with, yes, you're going to have to have somewhat of an external rotation of the feet. Obviously, the wider you go, the more uh, external rotation of the foot, um, just because you're going to need to make sure that those stay lined up, right? I mean, technically, you're not externally rotating your feet. You're keeping them in plane with the thighs. The external rotation is it's at the hip. It's kind of a, it's more of an abduction motion than external rotation or whatever. Don't worry about the semantics. Your, your thighs are getting further apart. That's all that matters. So this can limit range of motion at the knee, all right? So as you, as you get out wide, like what happens is we lose the ability to travel over our knees because our legs would have to keep parting, right? And so unless you're going to split yourself in two, then a wide stance squat is likely going to start limiting your range of motion at a certain point. So there becomes a point where wider or more excellently rotated is not necessarily better. It actually gets worse. Uh, and then just so you can see the last bit of that text, this is going to be an adductor 
dominant squat because two things. One, we are disadvantaging the glutes, and the other is we are advantaging the adductors uh, in this position by going wider. So some people think that the glutes have an external rotation uh, function. What, for the sake of this video, what I'll say is they just don't do that motion, right? So wider in a squat is not more glutes, okay? All right, so if we move on from there, let's just briefly cover a couple of these. I'm gonna make myself disappear here. So some general squat stance principles to maybe consider with this stuff in terms of what not to do. So a narrow neutral stance, which is the far left one here, that's gonna basically set you up where you're gonna be very limited for range of motion at the hip. So I put a little caution sign here. If you are doing like a sissy squat or something like that, narrow and straightforward may have some applications for you, right? Because you're gonna basically be able to drive your knee forward so far and so fast that you don't really need the range of motion at the hip. That makes that an acceptable motion. But outside of that, like what's going to happen is you're just going to tuck your butt and round your low back really fast in that type of a stance. Okay. Our middle one here, which is wide neutral, that's not going to be a good idea either. The wide neutral is basically going to put you in a position where your knees want or like or your thighs are angled out and your feet are angled forward and it's going to create some uh, rotational force at the knee joint from the relationship of the tibia to the femur and that's just an overall not a good happy thing okay the last one on the far right that i'm covering up right now is going to be a like sumo stance squat okay so for this the successive wide sumo stance squat Essentially, now the hip joint, the knee joint, nothing is really lined up well. The only reason that you would do a sumo stance, pull, squat, lift, or whatever, um, was because you were trying to take advantage of the leverage and not having to have much range of motion. I really don't see, um, like, maybe if you're trying to work um, adductors more, but there will still come a point where t it's too wide. And usually that happens before what we would typically classify as a sumo stance. Um, it even gets to the point where it's just it's just bad for the hips and everything all around. And so, especially when we're talking about quads, the, like that's completely worthless at that point in time. Okay, not going to get any quads out of that. So, if we look at our principles for what it's going to take for us to get a quad dominant squat, what we're going to look for is we're going to try and choose a stance for maximal range of motion at the knee. Okay, so some people we'll be able to use that very first stance uh, that we were talking about, the shoulder width semi-neutral, uh, but those are people that have to be able to basically very easily get to knee flexion and still have an upright torso. So that's basically short femur, long torso, long tibia, people with good ankle mobility. They can do the one on the far left, probably get there. For people that have more average proportions or whatnot, or even bad proportions, they're going to need to use the middle one here, that externally rotated position um, to be able to probably get a little bit more range of motion at the hip in order to accommodate them getting more depth in order to be able to get to uh, greater knee flexion, right? Because the longer your femur, the more depth that it takes for you to get to knee flexion. Same thing with ankle mobility and the tibia things, all those things, right? So basically, if you have any of these limitations, it just makes it harder to get to knee flexion without as much depth. So we need to find ways to get more depth, get that knee further forward, okay? Uh, two, we're going to use either a high bar or maybe a safety squat bar. No low bar because the whole purpose of the low bar is it makes you have to bend over more at the hip by putting well, it's not the purpose of it. It's to keep the load closer to your center mass so that there's not as much load at the hip. All right? So basically it allows you to have better leverage at the hip, but in order to get that going through this motion, it's going to make you fold faster at the hip. You're going to have to bend over more. Right, which is going to make it more hip dominant. So we want to use a high bar uh, or like a safety bar to make us stay more upright. Okay, You're not including a front squat. A lot of people think because the front squat allows you to sit more upright that it is uh, more quads, and not necessarily because again it's center mass. All right, it's the distance from the quads from the center mass. So if our torso is upright but the weight is in front of us, we still have to look at that and figure out where that situates from the knee. Um, and if you are a person that does have to bend over a little bit, which likely if you're having to do these manipulations to get more quads, then actually as you start to bend over, that load becomes even more challenging on the thoracic spine and whatnot and tends to actually become more hip dominant uh, and just more challenging from a stability perspective. So if your goal is to do a quad dominant squat, uh, the front squat is not a better quad dominant squat. Uh, I know that's been talked about and said for years and years and years, but 
it's just not the truth, right? It's just the physics of it. Um, and, you know, they've even done, like, there's, there's even plenty of research now that's kind of debunked that uh, myth, okay? Number three, consider a heel elevation, uh, which we'll go through some examples, is probably going to be everybody's best friend if you have trouble uh, getting your knee forward in the squat. Uh, some people will be able to make the adjustments to their stance uh, and be able to get more. But everybody, regardless of what you have going on, is going to be able to get more with heel elevation. We'll look at some examples. Uh, number four, uh, advantage quad loading. So do not disadvantage hip or spine stability. So uh, what we want to make sure that we're doing when we decide how we're going to go about our squat technique is we want to make sure that we're able to maintain stability at the spine and the glutes and all of the and all the pelvis musculature because ultimately that's what's going to allow us to you know support the load so that it is very easy for us to put a lot of neural drive into those quads if we do anything that compromises the stability it kind of puts the brakes on what we can do everywhere else because that now becomes uh, the weak link in the chain and it also takes more neural drive if any of those things are at a mechanical uh, disadvantage so let's look at some heel elevated squats here so if we look at the heel elevated squats what you're gonna notice is I have three bodies up here uh, I'll move myself in a second so you can see all three but basically the red line on here represents that center mass so that's essentially where the load is in this person's body and you'll see that that's kind of right at that midfoot so the knee to hip ratio in terms of how far they are away from that red line is what we're concerned about when we're talking about loading the quads and then how much knee flexion, right? Like how much hamstring on calf uh, do we have? So if I pull myself away here, you can see through these three examples that we have, right? So we got three different body types here. And when we put them on a externally rotated stance, it's fairly narrow, up on a heel elevation is that they all get a significant increase and not only the flexion at the knee, but how far away that knee is from the center mass. So in order for us to consider this a really quad dominant squat, we have to look at what, at what ratio do we have both in terms of the distance and the range of motion. So I'll bring myself back here. So if we go to uh, the one that's, I don't even know if this is left or right on your guys' screen, but the one that I'm not covering up, all right, you'll see that we essentially almost get double the like the distance, the double the moment of the knee, if you will. So that end squat, while more quad, is still fairly balanced. Like the butt is about the same distance away from that line as the knee. So from a load perspective, it's not that quad dominant, right? But if we look at the range of motion, there's a lot more knee flexion than there is hip flexion. There's so if you look at the first squat, you could see that Adam had more range of motion to be able to flex his hip. So in terms of loading and whatnot here, so if the narrow he is, obviously the more glutes they're gonna be. But the big thing is is that I'm able to get a full stretch on the quads and maybe the other things aren't under a full stretch. So even though it's balanced, we would teeter it to a modestly quad dominant squat. Okay, modestly quad down. Not the best quad dominant squat, but it's it's better than the first one. Okay, um, and this is going to be important when we talk about what what this would mean in terms of programming. Right? Is how good, how quad dominant is that squat really? So now I'm going to move myself again so that you can see. Uh, so the middle one here, all right, with Cody, he is able to get significantly less hip flexion, right? And the second one, and a little bit more quad bias than Adam was able to get, right? So this is a more quad dominant squat now than Adam's quad dominant squat on the far side. And then if we look at the very far right with Austin in the red shirt, you will see that with that one, that's an even greater extreme in terms of what we were able to do. So of all of these squats, they were all able to make them more quad dominant, but the one on the right is much more quad dominant. So if we were looking at the challenge for these guys and who is going to have a harder time making this quad dominant, especially as they got into fatigue or they incorporate supersets or pre-exhaust, post-exhaust, all of those things, the squat, the Adam squat, the one that's modestly quad dominant, that's going to be a hard technique to maintain if the quads are fatigued, right? Or if they're weak. So from a programming standpoint, whether or not that becomes a viable quad training tool 
depends on the programming conditions and the strength of my quads in that position. So in reality, you know, hack squats and things like that might be better solutions for wanting to get a lot more quad because, and you have to think about what you want from programming here because that squat is not coming with a ton of quad dominance and no glute and hip work. So depending on whether today also happens to be a day where I want to load that musculature, this may or may not fit in there, right? If tomorrow I'm doing, uh, you know, RDLs or something like that, I'm doing some sort of hip extension work, this probably is not going to work out well uh, at any considerable volume, intensity, failure, etc., because it's going to overlap too much into the next day's training. So just, those are things you have to consider. Whereas we look at a very quad dominant squat, it's going to have a much smaller training stimulus and stress on that hip musculature and on the spinal musculature, which then opens up different options for uh, programming, whether within the same workout to be able to have more uh, hip extension work within that or the subsequent workout or whatever. I mean, it just all depends on the split you have and the type of training you're doing, et cetera, et cetera. But you can see how these things are going to affect whether or not that squat fits your current programming situation. Okay. So another squat we can look at uh, or talk about would be what we call like the weightlifting squat. Um, and so I was recently on a podcast uh, for Revive Stronger. Um, so you can kind of like see this guy right here. Um, but basically what we talked about with that is looking at what's going on What's going on in a Olympic weightlifting style squat? And when we look at an Olympic weightlifting style squat, you're going to see that the squat technique is set up for Olympic lifting, meaning that it's designed to carry over to the technique of the catch. So if you watch a guy when he's catching a clean or a snatch or whatever, it's it's more of a swing type motion where the hips and the knees are drop they're like scooping that down and then forward so it's kind of a back down and forward it's like a swing motion whereas the traditional squats more of a up and down folding at both the knee and the hip type motion so when we're doing if you're doing a weightlifting squat you're not doing a weightlifting squat because you're trying to build quads or because you want to be the strongest squatter you should be doing a weightlifting squat because it's going to carry over uh, to your sport of weightlifting, right? And that's where the mechanics of that swing motion come in. So what this ends up being is it's a squat that finishes at the knees coming, uh, with the knees coming forward, uh, and the butt as well. So the whole like hip and complex is coming forward. Uh, it minimizes the eccentric uh, of the quads, and it's basically very VMO dominant. So what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to pull up actually a video of Mike Squat, he gave me permission to kind of analyze these videos. Um, so this squat here, right? This is Mike's. Uh, this is Mike Squat, um, and uh, he can give you more explanations on why he's doing this or, or whatever. I'm not going to attempt to read his mind. Um, I'm just going to explain to you what I see going on in this squat. So the first thing you'll see is that there's a kickback at the hip. So it's a it's a lumbar spine pelvic tilt um, or lumbar extension and uh, pelvic tilt motion anterior pelvic tilt here at the beginning right so as Mike's going through this motion right if you go by my principles which is we want us we want the knee motion to be dominant so right now this is all hip and spine dominant okay which is doing one thing I mean one it's it's loading the hip musculature uh, especially the uh, the adductors because of the the lumbar extension that's coming here right is going to kind of con it's going to kind of limit the glutes contribute contribution a little bit um, but so this we're preloading the hips in this case especially the adductors the hamstrings are going to going to take some load here, but as soon as the knee bends, the hamstrings are limited in their contribution, right? So this ends up being a uh, very adductor and lumbar spine loading position to start when I'm looking at the mechanics of this position. But what that is accomplishing is it's accomplishing with uh, Mike's, if you look at Mike's ratios, he's got small femurs, long torso in, re in relationship. And so with his ability to contort his spine, he's able to keep the basically the load really close to his body or really really centered every like there's an, when we're looking at loading a, a joint we're trying to get it far away what this is doing is it's allowing everything to stay very close right so there's a mechanical 
advantage to that that, you know, like if we're in the sport of weightlifting or something like that, that may be beneficial. But from a hypertrophy perspective, from a just training the muscles perspective, may not be the best technique uh, in, in my opinion. Okay, so if, if we move forward with this, all right, we start watching. So now it's kind of balanced. We have hip and knee motion happening at the same time, okay? So, which is fine. We got both things folding. And what, what you're gonna see is we're gonna get to a point where about right here, Mike's hip foldability is going to end, right? So this would essentially be like end of glute range uh, for Mike right here, okay? And now what you're gonna see, because this is a weightlifting squat, right, is you're gonna see the what we did is a kickback, right? The butt came down with the knees and then it's gonna cut under, right? So we watch that squat and everything goes forward. You see it kind of like, it's like his thighs fall forward and that's part of what drives the knees in is the butt coming down, right? And so it's it's hard to see uh, from, the, from this view here, but usually when we see that there is some loss of that lumbar curve, like so, for a good squat position, we want to maintain neutral spine, which is slight lumbar extension, right? Not overextended, but slight lumbar extension and avoid flexion. When we start to see a posterior tilt, then the spine can pull past neutral and go into a degree of flexion. Now, mentioned earlier, Mike's port proportions, right? So if you look at Mike here in this position and you were to measure the, the length of his torso, like the distance between that bar and his hip joint versus the distance between his knee joint and his hip joint, you can see how like his torso is like, like at least one and a half times as long as his femur. So in this case, it allows him to maintain a fairly upright position with minimal like spinal flexion and butt tuck, right? I mean, I've watched a few of these videos and some of them there's some and uh, and others, his technique is a, is a little bit better. Again, strength and fatigue affect our mechanics in this, whether we want to admit it or not. Like, a, like our form has to be, de or our form is dependent on our ability to actually load those joints and control it. So, in this in this particular video here, right, it looks like his spine is staying rel relatively neutral. I mean, was there definitely some lumbar extension and then going back into neutral? But from here, I can't really say one way or another whether there's a uh, like spinal flexion uh, in the lumbar spine here or much pelvic tuck especially you got a guy with a lot of muscles on him you really can't see that from a small video like this of how much of that is just the you know it's just the tissue and how much of it is actually the, the, the joint position there right so uh, we'll play this video out so we got extension at the spine down and then sit and it pops forward so when we're on the call and we're doing the podcast right uh, and we're talking about uh, getting more uh, quads. So th this is a technique, I believe, that Mike likes for quads. And when we look at this squat, and some people are like, well, that's that's not a quad dominant squat at all. If they're familiar with what we look at as a quad dominant squat with the knees driving forward and whatnot. And what I'll say is, well, I agree that this is not how I would uh, squat for quads. Um, but the actual outcome is going to be quads, and this is this is likely why. If we look at this position, right, in the top here, the, everything's able to stay fairly close, right? So even though the hips are loaded here, they're not that far away from the load. We essentially this is a mechanically favorable position, and then once we get to about here, right, still like the knees are pretty much on, like they're almost under the bar. Like the quads haven't had to do any work yet. But in the entire bottom half, the knees are going to go forward, okay? And so because he got to a position where he ran out of hip range first, and the end motion is that swing into hip flexion, and therefore in order to initiate this movement back up, it has to be that push back out. Now there's a lot of people that from that skill point might just like lumbar extend or do something else out of it. It just depends on how they got in there, whether or not they rounded and posterior tilted and whatnot, right? Um, so in a sense, I want to say for what Mike is doing, he's or trying to do, he, he's, he's doing it well. Um, so the quads are taking the blunt of the load in the position where the joints are most overloaded, but they're also only working for a part of the range of motion. Um, and if we look at typical Olympic lifters, I mean, it, you notice that like their quads are very VMO dominant, right? And the VMO is more active in that very 
bottom position. And as you start to get to a more knee extended position, the other quadriceps start to pick up a little bit more favorable mechanics over the VMO. So if you look at that, if you look at how this is working, and now you also look at the actual outcome of what these guys look like from a uh, physique development perspective, you can see that like, okay, this is of, of all the musculature being worked here, the quads are taking the blunt of trauma because they're the thing that's getting stretched. Okay. Uh, but it's not a, it's not a very good quad exercise in terms of overall development. And in my opinion, it's not the strategy that I would use because I'm kind of putting my spine in a more compromised position uh, than I would like, and I'm avoiding loading the quads and the, the rest of the range of motion. Um, so I think that we could build a better quad exercise than this. So uh, I'm going to pull up our exercise library here and go to primary muscle group and we'll put in quadriceps and let's choose squatting movements. Right, so we don't just see all of the squat ex or all of the uh, quad exercises. Okay, so we got some uh, we got some quad and well, just all of our squats here, right? So okay, so uh, if we're gonna look at quad dominance, right? So if you notice this one here, just says uh, or the top left one, I guess you can't see my cursor, just says squats. Uh, we want to go to one that says quad, so that's gonna be like a heel elevated barbell squat. Um, so if we go to this guy here. Let's open that. Um, and then what we're going to do is look at the video of a heel elevated squat. So uh, this is our library here. It's got these videos that go and kind of wrap around. They'll loop on their own, but I'm going to click it here and then I can just kind of move the video to wherever I want. So we're going to go to a side view at the bottom of that squat. So for here, what I'm looking at, okay, is I want to make sure that that knee is further away out or as far out as we can get. Right now, this video here, this is with a, um, a regular wedge, which is not as gonna be as good as the individual solo split wedges. Um, but we look at this mo motion here, right? You're gonna see that the knees, going f the knees are going forward and the butt is going down, right? That's how we're starting this motion. So that means from the get-go, boom, the quads are getting loaded, okay? So from a neurological perspective, I'm, I'm, I'm already putting neurological work into the quads, right? I'm already loading that joint and that joint is gonna stay under control the whole time, right? And I'm already initiating eccentric work with the quadriceps at that point in time. So as I go down, right, in order to maintain that center mass, you'll see that the hips have to start flexing, right? But because of that heel elevation, it allows those knees to go so far forward that the butt really doesn't have to go back much, right? So I'm able to take away the work of, at the hip by just putting less mechanical load on there and increasing the mechanical load on the quads and I'm able to do it for a greater percentage of range of motion, right? Um, and if we look at a different body type here, uh, I'll load up a female video here. Um, we'll look at another structure, right? So, okay, so here we got another quad dominant squat, right? And so this is Chelsea and I will tell you is that Chelsea is not built to squat for quads. She's got long femurs. Right? But if we watch this motion, okay, knees are going forward right away, right? Butt's coming down. So with Chelsea, when she starts to get to here, right, you can see that her knee can't travel much further forward. So in order for her to get more depth, her butt has to go back a little bit. So between these two, right, Austin in the first video has a more quad dominant squat than Chelsea does, right? Let's see if we can get another side shot here, right? So if we look at like center of mass, okay, where that where this bar uh, is over her thighs, it is quad dominant, but it's not as quad dominant as uh, Austin. So if you were to say from a programming standpoint, which one of these would, you know, grow their quads better with squats, it would be Austin. Uh, and, Le and Chelsea is going to have to, you know, take into account that there's going to be a lot more glutes in her squat, which most females, that's perfectly fine, um, you know, but if, uh, if she were to decide to split up her day or, or her split or whatever, um, that's just something that she has to account for, right? And what, what interventions that she would use from a programming standpoint uh, would need to be different than Austin's to make a workout either isolated quad dominant or to calculate the volume of quad and hip in that workout because basically her squat is quad and hip always where Austin like has the ability, especially when we look back at his ability on the um, – 
let's see, on this one here. And, well, I'm covering it up. Let's do this, this one here. All right, so you can see that's a very, very quad dominant position, right? In that case, right? And those are 20 degree wedges, by the way, for anybody that wants to know the 20 degree uh, solo wedges, which for most people, a 20 degree wedge is going to be plenty, right? That's, that's typically uh, what I'm going to recommend most people get. Uh, some people can do a, uh, a full squat on a 10 degree wedge. Almost nobody needs a 30 degree wedge. Uh, but if your goal is to get this as a quad dominant tool, I would say there's really not much in terms of a con of going from a 10 to a 20, uh, as long as you just understand that your the bottom of your squat ends at the knee flexion. Because if you if if you're using too much of a wedge, what will happen is you'll be at end knee flexion and you'll be able to like round and clump lower into the squat, but it'll be all hips and spine at that point, and that breaks our principle of wanting to end and start with quad or knee flexion extension, so with the quads, okay? Um, I'll load up, I got a safety uh, squat bar for you guys here uh, as well. Same general principles um, from a technique perspective. Uh, so you can see here, like, if I'm doing this for quads, right, first thing is those knees, pop them forward right away, right? Now the safety squat bar, right, is gonna put the load a little further forward, okay? That's what the whole purpose of this is. Can't really tell from there, but if I come around, Right, you can see right there the camber of that bar. It moves the bar a little bit further forward. This will vary depending on the actual bar that you use, um, but essentially it allows you to stay a little bit more upright. But it doesn't necessarily deload the hips because the weight is in front of you a little bit more. So you might be at a more upright position, but literally carrying the same amount of torque at the hip. So don't mistake the fact that because a bar position allows you to be more upright that it's less hips because if a bar's in front of you, you're more upright, but the weight is in front of you and you're having to resist that force. So it's just where the center of mass is. So in reality, as we move a bar position, you know, from front to back, we don't really gain in it like a deload of the hip musculature per se uh, in most individuals, right? With a low bar, it moves the load proportionately closer to the hips. So the same load would be less work for the hips but that's a powerlifting thing. So what do they do? They do the low bar and then they put more load on it. So it's the same amount of work at the hip, but there's more load on the bar and that's their sport, put as much load on the bar so that it works well for that, but it's an inefficient thing for uh, trying to build muscle, right? Um, and I, you know, I mean, we get out with the spine thing, but that would just be a huge tangent on this video. Uh, so if I go back to my presentation here, um, I just want to cover the last few things I have. So in terms of the spine and the pelvis and stability, right, things we want to avoid is excessive lumbar extension because this is going to shorten the erectors and a shortened muscle is basically at a poor length tension relationship in terms of being able uh, to produce force. So muscles tend to be strongest in their mid range. This varies from muscle to muscle, joint to joint. Um, but in general, at the, the terminal flexion or extension is, is going to be weaker, but the one thing that's always consistent is every muscle's weakest point in terms of the actual tissue is going to be its most shortened contracting position. Uh, so if we maximally extend that lumbar spine, essentially what we're doing is we are putting the those muscles in a point where they are going to they can become a weak link in the chain. Uh, and they're expending a lot more energy and they're also taking a lot more uh, neurological and like like a lot more neurological work, right? So the amount of neural drive that I have to go to my quads starts to get dropped down when it has to go to all these other places, right? And the most neurologically com complex place to take a muscle is into its fully shortened position because you have to be shortening the most amount of muscle fibers there, okay? So number two, posterior tilting in the bottom, that's going to force the glute and the erectors to basically decrease tension. Uh, we're going to get some lumbar flexion, which from a spinal mechanics perspective, right? So the lumbar, the, the, the erectors are lengthening when we flex at the spine, but from a leverage standpoint, the joints are now becoming disadvantaged and the forces on the spine are becoming, we'll say, less healthy uh, in, in that case, right? So we're starting to lose the mechanics that allow us to you know, really control the low back positions. So 
This is why neutral is, we want enough of a lumbar extension to maintain the leverage, but not so much that we are uh, putting the muscles at a disadvantage from a length tension relationship. That's why neutral spine when we're trying to load our legs is, is, is going to be key because it's that mid range, it's that, that middle of the range spot where the muscles and the joints both are at their optimal position to resist force, uh, which makes it very easy for us to load our legs. Okay, uh, number three is the look up and the chest up cues. They tend to encourage excessive lumbar extension and discourage natural folding patterns. So when we talk about natural folding patterns, what, what I want to be able to happen is I want my, my body to be able to easily maintain that center of mass. And my nervous system is gonna figure out the most efficient way to do that. So if I add the cue of driving the knee forward and let my unconscious nervous system decide where my torso needs to be to support my stability there, that's gonna be the most efficient position. But if I'm trying to maintain a fixed torso position or manipulate that bar, it's gonna interfere with my intent of wanting to drive the knees forward. So when you have those two, oftentimes it creates kind of like a, like a neurological farce in somebody's body and they can't figure out what to do and you'll see it in their body. Uh, it becomes a, a discoordinated movement and oftentimes you know it fails all over the place so what we typically see is when people are looking up or chest upping you know too much is they will get more of the valgus more of the knees dropping in um, if you teach people to put their knee push their knees out that doesn't solve the reason why the knees were dropping in the knees were dropping in because the lumbar and the glutes and stuff were not able to fully contribute the adductors had to kick in too much and that causes the knee to dump in, right? So it's not a weak glute need or, or whatever. Um, it's, it's a change in how the body is having to manage that force. So if we can keep the glutes and the hams and the rec fem and all of those things in a position where they're able to stabilize the pelvis and the spine easily, right? We don't have to expend as much neurological energy on it and we're able to maintain proper knee mechanics with no valgus, et cetera, uh, throughout that motion. Okay. So, um, I'm gonna pull this up one more time here. Uh, let's look at this guy here. So this is just another one of those videos uh, from Mike. Um, so just one more. So if we're looking at this squat, right? And again, this is like my evaluation of this, right? So the squat starts with cervical extension, lumbar extension, anterior pelvic tilt. So we're stacking the stacking the weight over the knees right now, which is decreasing quad engagement. Then we get to the point where both things are going to flex, right? So, uh, but at this point, like if you can tell, like the load is pretty close to the knee compared to the hip. So it's not going to be until right here, right? So essentially, we're like we're already to parallel per se, and then then we push into that, right? And if it weren't for the, the swing type motion, like if, if you were to come straight vertical from this, it would be more balanced because the weight is still close to the quads. It's kind of, it's, it's a little bit off an angle, so I, can't, I didn't put a direct comparison to uh, the other squat positions. Um, but if we're looking at this in this sense, right, if he wasn't pushing himself back, which makes that like, it changes the angle of force, right? So we're not going straight up and down. He's literally pushing his hips back and then up. That's the thing that allows this to be quads at the bottom, right? So it is quad dominant, but it is not the way that I would do a quad dominant squat for all of those given reasons, right? Um, so now we just get all of that stuff out of the way. So to kind of give you guys a little bit to go with just from a programming perspective, um, one of the things that we talked on that podcast is uh, the usage of a pre or a post exhaust. Uh, we're talking about like so if you are the if you have trouble getting quads in your squat, is what should we do from a programming perspective while still using the squat? So let's just say that the first thing that you should do is find the most quad dominant squat that you can do. Okay? If it is not that quad dominant, do a different exercise. There's like rule number one. If you can't do a quad dominant squat, don't do squats for quads, okay? If you can do a squat that is quad dominant, but it's still some other stuff or whatever, is there the potential to use a pre or post exhaust uh, method in there where you do another exercise before or after? 
okay? Uh, and I'm going to say that, like, in terms of a programming perspective, I would do this more in a superset fashion because I'm going to get the, the effect of that pre or post exhaust is going to be much greater in terms of the impact of muscle bias by having it, like, back to back. I'm going to be able to use that fatigue to my advantage every set, not just the accumulation of sets. Um, so if we look at that scenario, if we are in a position where we're not able to get a really good quad dominant squat, which is the case where you would probably need to do some sort of pre or post exhaust type technique. If I fatigue the quads first, what that's going to do is it's going to decrease my ability to place load on the knee in a squat. So basically one of two things is going to happen. Either I'm not going to be able to keep that squat quad dominant because I'm going to have to put, shift my body to push more load on the hip, and there's no amount of willpower that can force the quads to work more than they have capacity to do, right? You could make, I mean, the goal of an exercise in terms of challenge is to make, make it challenging for the muscle from a contractile perspective, not make it harder from a t technique perspective, right? So I, I don't, you know, you could say like, oh, well, you just have to like try and get into the hardest part of an exercise. Like, that doesn't, that doesn't, that doesn't work if it's like, like a, it's not, not something you mechanically can do. All it's going to do is you're going to compensate or, or something else. So if you were to do this with proper form, what's going to happen is the load's going to have to drop to basically almost like an insignificant amount. Um, now, and it's still going to be somewhat dispersed, right? But at least it'll be insignificant for the other tissue. So your your ability to keep challenging that muscle is going to be limited you like in my opinion if you're going to do that you would have to like do like only partials at the bottom or, or something and if you took the if you took the first exercise to any relative degree of failure going into the squat you're just like it's just not a very realistic training uh, position to be in right now if you were to replace the squat with like a hack squat where now i don't have the ability to shift to make it more hips and less quads from a, a joint perspective, it'll still happen from a contractile perspective because it's a closed chain movement. So I could technically not use any quads and like my hips and calves and stuff would still be able to drive uh, that motion. But I'm able to push the quads closer into failure without losing technique um, and while being able to manage a little bit more respectable load in that scenario. Okay, so if we were going to use the squat, the best scenario is going to be able to use whatever our more quad dominant squat is while we are fresh as the first exercise and then carry over into the second exercise where I can extend the work of those quads into a deeper degree of failure than the other musculature. So one, it's going to be more quads. Two, it's not going to bring on uh, anything else. Uh, and if we look at neurological or systemic fatigue, it's easier to perform a like leg extension in a state of fatigue than it is a squat. So when we look at the productivity that you're going to get out of the individual exercises and this superset as a whole, it's one, it's easier to work hard in a post-exhaust fashion in this way. Now, I'm not saying that pre-exhaust is better than post-exhaust in all scenarios. Um, this is definitely always going to be something that is specific. So the principles that you need to think of when it comes to pre or post exhaust is, does this make it easier for me to challenge that muscle? That's essentially, that's essentially what your programming goals should be. It's like logistically, this allows me to challenge that muscle and focus more on the effort, less on the technique. That's the whole goal of choosing uh, better exercises that suit you mechanically better, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And then don't just be tied to a certain exercise. So how well you could perform either of these still depends on how good of a quad dominant squat that you could make. Um, I'm not going to dig even deeper into the pre or post exhaust thing. It's one of the most complex uh, topics, but hopefully from this you take away um, a little bit about uh, what you could do for your squats, what limitations you might have, and make the decision on whether or not you would squat for quads, whether or not you would use a post exhaust uh, to, like with a leg extension or something uh, and still use a squat uh, for your particular block of programming or if you should ditch, ditch it. Um, hopefully you're empowered with all that information and in reality, you know, the best thing that we can do from a training perspective, right, is always try and put our body in the best possible position to get the outcome that we want, right? We want to make things easy to do so that we can do them hard. Thanks, guys.